Well, we have finally reached the supposed end of the road for Kiss, uh, at least Kiss in the flesh, which we'll get into that whole ridiculous thing here in a minute. And of course, they had their quote unquote final show available on pay per view for $40, which I bought so that you didn't have to. Let's discuss. For starters, I got to say that I am wildly disappointed with pay-per-view or ppv.com, whatever it's called. I've never used it before, but my God, what a disaster it was. I bought my ticket like three hours in advance, and then when the thing finally started at like 8 o'clock, it uh, kicked me out and said I didn't have a ticket, and it was just a, a whole mess just getting in. So unfortunately, I missed a majority of like the first 10 to 15 minutes or so, I only saw just a few seconds here or there before I got booted. And there were also a number of times throughout the roughly three-hour event where it would just totally freeze up and then eventually uh, boot me. Uh, sometimes it would restart on its own. But I don't know if that was on my end. Everything else that was on Wi-Fi in my house was working fine. Don't know if it was on uh, PPV's end. But I will say, uh, even just in terms of production and presentation, some of it was definitely a little bit sloppy, which... I don't know, it's kind of crazy you think doing these big UFC fights and things, they'd be a little bit more organized, but that was not the case, certainly not the smoothest thing that I have ever watched. Anyways, the pre-show and the post-show were hosted by Allison Hagendorf, uh, who if you don't know, she used to be the global head of rock at Spotify. I don't know what she does now. I, I think she has a, a show, but I, I'm not quite sure what else. Uh, and then there was another guy named Guns who was doing a lot, a lot more interaction with the crowd. But again, I missed the first couple minutes. I'm not entirely sure who Guns is. After showing some brief footage uh, of the guys in the band to start the show, it cut to Allison, who was on the B stage, which is the smaller stage opposite the main stage. Uh, where Paul eventually flies out to for Love Gun and I was made for loving you. Uh, and of all people, she was interviewing Chris Angel. Uh, I mean, I'm not entirely sure why. I mean, look, maybe he's got some history with the band um, that, that plays a key role, which I, I certainly don't think that's the case. Nothing against Chris Angel. I've always liked the guy. I thought that show Mind Freak that he had was cool when I was 12. Uh, but again, not quite sure why he was a part of this, but nonetheless... Cool to see him. They then brought out Desmond Child, who, if you don't know, Desmond is a very, very prolific songwriter. Uh, he's written about a million songs that we all know. It's really like, what songs didn't he write? Uh, including for Kiss, probably most notably, I Was Made for Loving You. Uh, but he's also written songs for Aerosmith, Bon Jovi, uh, even Cher and, and things like that. A, a million different people. And funny enough, Desmond was actually supposed to be on this show earlier this week, uh, but he had to postpone at the last second, uh, which I'm, I'm working on a later date with his side right now. So uh, stick around for that if you're interested. But I wouldn't be shocked if this played a role in his postponement. I don't know how, how soon this thing got booked up and have him out there, but you know, definitely felt a little odd that he canceled or postponed and then showed up on, on uh, at Kiss's final show. But it was cool, and in his new book, uh, Living on a Prayer, Big Songs, Big Life, Paul Stanley uh, actually wrote the foreword, and Desmond has for, forever credited Paul with teaching him how to write stadium anthems, so it was great to uh, see them acknowledge him. Following the brief chat with Desmond, they cut two separate interviews that Allison did uh, with both Paul and Gene. And with Paul's, I don't think he really said anything noteworthy, nothing really worth discussing, just your usual uh, run-of-the-mill type of stuff, generic answers, whatever. But in her interview with Gene, I did find it rather amusing that Gene said that he has always been delusional about himself uh, with the way that he perceives himself. And like... If nothing else, you've got to admire Gene's brutal honesty and just how blunt he is. My God. Allison also did a joint interview uh, with Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer, uh, where Eric acknowledged that both he and Tommy were only there because of Ace and Peter, which is obviously, of course, 100% true, but it was very cool to see him say that publicly, as I believe that was the only acknowledgement of Ace and Peter, but, uh, you know. 
It should come as no surprise, not a shocker whatsoever. Speaking of Tommy Thayer, perhaps the most notable moment of the pre-show was when Allison brought up Gene's two kids, uh, Nick and Sophie, and then one of Paul's kids. And then towards the end of that whole bit, she brought up Tommy Thayer's daughter. I can't remember her name. But what's fascinating is that she only met Tommy three years ago. They only knew of each other, I should say. Uh, three years ago, as I guess she took a DNA test, like Ancestry.com or whatever, found a, a cousin uh, through that that she connected with, and then eventually discovered that Tommy was her dad, which is just crazy shit. What a great story. I, I would love to hear more on that. Anyways, the show finally starts at 845 with, of course, Detroit Rock City, and right off the rip, I gotta say, no surprises, but Paul's vocal performance was rough at best. Obviously, he's now in his early 70s, so nobody expects him to sound today in 2023 like he did 50 years ago, but god damn, it was really bad at times. I mean, even when he was just talking to the crowd in between the songs, his voice was just super, super shaky and pitchy, and outside of that, he just repeated these same things after every song. I mean... Towards the end, I was just like, I don't know how many more times I can hear, hey, people, here's one. I mean, oh, good God almighty. We're not going to go through the set list song by song, but what I did find to be super annoying is that they played the exact same night, uh, same set as the night before at Madison Square Garden. If you don't know, they did two shows in a row, Friday and Saturday night at Madison Square Garden, two nights in a row, and you can't change it up at all? Not to mention, it's a hometown show uh, in arguably the most famous arena in the world. You can't throw in even a single deep cut, not even a, a partial one. I, I mean, my God. I say partial because just like on Friday night, both Psycho Circus and 100,000 Years, uh, maybe this is how it's been the whole tour, I don't know. Those two songs were only done uh, in part they could have easily thrown something in. They spend so much time uh, with Tommy's guitar solo, and then they do a guitar battle between Tommy and Paul. Then they got Eric's drum solo, and then Gene's bass solo. That They eat up like 15 to 20 minutes in fucking solos. They could have easily thrown in a, a couple songs, some deep cuts or whatever, to please, to please the fans. As according to them, this is the end. But if you're not going to do that, then how about you... Put something to put a little video together and pay a tribute to Eric Carr. Gene just recently mentioned in a Rolling Stone interview that Ace and Peter certainly played an integral role uh, in the band. Obviously, it was great to hear him say that, but you didn't offer him any money to come out to the last show, which, you know, certainly at least on Ace's end, we haven't heard from Peter, but on Ace's end, definitely a little greedy. I'm not, not saying that they would have let him out, uh, even if he said he would show up for free, but... <laughs> I mean, just, I, I don't know. It just, it was ridiculous. At, at the very least, do something for Eric Carr. There's just so many routes that they could have gone, but no. Same exact Kiss show that we've had for years now, right down to the production, the set list, the whole thing. One thing that also annoyed me, and you can shit on me in the comments. I'm sure I'm being extremely nitpicky here, but I, I don't know. I just, I did find it a little annoying uh, is when Paul St the Paul Stanley interview was playing before the show, he told a, a story of driving a cab back in 72 or 73. He dropped somebody off at Madison Square Garden. Uh, they were going to go see Elvis. And in his mind, he's like, someday people will be coming here to the garden to see me and my band. It's a cool story, in all honesty. It's really a great story. But then he told the story again on stage during the show. And I believe, and I could be wrong here, but... I believe that everybody that was in attendance at the show was also watching these pre-show interviews and all that kind of stuff on the screens. So to me, it just felt a little bit redundant. And honestly, with the time that uh, he took up telling the story, again, there's another couple of minutes to throw in another song. I guess that's my biggest problem with the whole thing. Uh, aside from the pre-show stuff, nothing was done to make this feel any different than a regular Kiss show. Like I said, the same show that we've had for years, same old set, same old production, same old everything, down to the voice cracks and backing tracks, which uh, no rhyme intended. But uh, on that end, I will say it did not appear that Paul was singing to a track very often, uh, as a lot of it, like I said, was very, very rough and and. 
it, it was it was hard to listen to at times. But I will say, for whatever reason, Psycho Circus in particular uh, felt extremely track to me. But it was the only one that uh, made me feel like that. And I don't know if this is a common thing or what, but I've also noticed uh, the last few times I've seen Motley Crue live. There's a, a couple of songs in the set. Clearly, we know Vince Neil does not sing to a track, but. There are a couple of songs like uh, The Dirt and then uh, it seems like anything from Saints of Los Angeles, it seems like it's tracked. So that doesn't uh, that doesn't make sense why there's uh, tracks on some songs but not on others. But uh, on the other hand, Gene I thought sounded pretty good the whole way through. But in Paul's defense, Gene uh, has a totally different style and is not really singing those high notes like Paul. Obviously, it's a little bit more gravelly, aggressive uh, a lot easier to do in your 70s than the type of stuff that Paul's doing. For me, I think Paul was at his worst just before Cold Gin, where he told a story of the first Kiss show at Madison Square Garden uh, in 77, which coincidentally is the same year that Elvis Presley died. Uh, and then his parents and Gene's parents were there and all that. But then he does this a cappella bit before the song. And my God, it was just, it was out of control, literally. Not a good performance. The other thing I thought was a bit strange was that after Black Diamond, of course, they go away and, well, we'll see ya. But then, inevitably, they come back out for an encore, which started with Beth. Uh, but then, after Beth, they acted like the show was over, tossing out picks and drumsticks, uh, taking the photo from the stage, all that kind of stuff, like it was the end of the show. But then they end up doing uh, Do You Love Me and then, of course, Rock and Roll All Night. So... It was a little bit of a strange dynamic, but at the same time, I do not watch Kiss live videos all the time, so perhaps that's that's what they normally do, but uh, at least at the time when it was happening, it felt a little bit strange. However, it did make more sense after they finished with Rock and Roll All Night, uh, because at the end of the song, Paul said, you know, whatever, thank you, and we will all see you again, you know, whatever, that they're going to be in different projects Whatever, we'll see what happens with that. But then God gave rock and roll to you, which every time I hear of, I always think of Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. It's like my favorite movie, and I, it's just such a fucking great song. But anyways, God uh, God gave rock and roll to you. He's playing over the PA with this animated video of all four members of the bands as like characters, uh, like a video game or something, which we now know to be the future of Kiss moving forward, I guess. This whole virtual thing uh, there was some speculation that there would be an announcement made at this final show about the future of the band whether it was you know going to continue on with new members and maybe they introduced the new members that night whatever uh but now we know it's it's virtual kiss and i thought you know with this show started at 8 45 i believe the show on friday started at 9 that's according to setlist fm so i'm like all right there's an extra 15 minutes maybe they're going to make some whole uh, a big announcement or whatever um but no they just uh they end the show with that little three minute video whatever it was a shortened version of god gave rock and roll to you uh they got that video playing and now it's it's virtual kiss from here on out i guess which is just about the dumbest fucking shit i've ever heard in my life i mean i guess we'll see how it pans out but remember the deal hologram Give me a fucking break, man. Upon the show ending, Allison Hagendorf did an interview almost immediately uh, with Gene, and then his daughter showed up, uh, and then after that, his wife. And I, I gotta say, I, I'm sure this is somewhat emotional for Paul and Gene especially, but Gene and his family, I, I don't know. It just didn't seem like a big deal. Uh, Gene was like, even like, you know, I know it looks like sweat, but it's tears. I don't know. It just felt so forced because there's a camera right there in their face. I, I could be wrong. Obviously, I don't know the members of KISS, don't know their families, but that's the vibe I got. I will say, though, uh, regarding Gene's family, it was funny. In the pre-show when Allison was interviewing his kids, his son Nick was like, I thought this was over in 99. This seems real, though. So that uh, was kind of funny, but I, I don't know. It just The, the whole thing just uh, it felt a little disingenuous to me there was also a very quick uh tommy thayer interview with he was still in his makeup but he had a bathrobe on uh, and then followed by a somewhat surprising george lopez uh interview he was there with his daughter mayan they were both talking and my god what a chat i, I love george lopez i think his uh george lopez the the sitcom from the 2000s is 
absolutely incredible. Although that new show, Lopez versus Lopez, is probably one of the worst shows I've ever seen. But holy shit, the guy is talking like a million miles an hour. You can't even follow along with what he's saying. I don't know if he was fucked up or what, but even his daughter, Maya, she's like, it seemed like she's looking at him like, oh my God, like, you know, what's going to happen? Like, I, I, I don't even know. Uh, it also made no sense that George Lopez, of all people, was there for an interview. But to that point, think of what the guest list for this show must have looked like. I heard Sebastian Bach was there as well, which, I mean, no surprises there. That guy's a huge Kiss fan. But I'm sure there were a million bigger names than that, if I had to guess. Say what you will of Kiss, but this is certainly a big, big deal, and, and so many people have spent their lives with Kiss. The comedian Craig Gass, uh, who if you don't remember, I mean, he was on the Howard Stern Show a bunch. I think he still does, he still does uh, some voices for them, uh, stuff like that. But he was on, he did a very famous uh, Gene Simmons bit, I, I believe it was Gene, on the Howard Stern Show like 20 years ago. I mean, his impressions are just spot on. And he was featured in a couple of the interviews, but no, he wasn't actually being talked to. He was just always happened to be lurking wherever the cameras were and then like taking photos. I don't know. It was the, the funniest thing. And I know he was doing some Kiss related shows recently leading up to this. And uh, a few weeks ago, he was on Eddie Trunk and he told the story where he was at, uh, or he told the story Sebastian Bach told him where Sebastian was at Gene Simmons' house. He sees a bag of something. He asked Gene, he goes, hey, what is that? And Gene's like, oh, these are the new uh, Kiss cell phone covers or whatever for the holiday season. Uh, not this year. I don't know when this story was. But anyways, Sebastian's like, oh, can I have one? And Gene's like, sorry, I wish I could, but you can go to kissonline.com and purchase one. Such a fucking great story. And so Gene Simmons. The pay-per-view concluded with a very, very brief interview with the longtime manager, Doc McGee, who... You know, at this point, I mean, the guy does interviews and stuff on his own. He's really like the fifth member of KISS. Uh, and he was talking about how great this virtual future will be and it's going to outlive all of us and, and blah, blah, blah. You know, basically saying it's going to be a huge money machine, which I I, I don't know. Uh, it, but if you go to KISSonline.com, now I sound like Gene Simmons, uh, but there's a 32-minute documentary where all of this stuff is discussed in more detail. They had like a three-minute documentary kind of showing that the making of, like the motion capture that the guys were doing for the characters and all that. But I've not been able to check out this 32-minute one yet. I mean, the, the pay-per-view just ended just a little bit ago. But regardless of, of watching that or how this whole virtual thing turns out, I just I, I don't see my opinion on, on how stupid this is changing. And I, I certainly don't think that I'm alone I would say most people uh, are, are in my corner, at least on that one. I am very curious to see how the whole thing plays out, but I, I just think it's it's still just incredibly stupid, beyond stupid, really. All in all, it was an enjoyable way to spend a Saturday night, but with the $40 price tag, uh, I mean, you know, I did see somewhere on Reddit or something, somebody was like, oh, well, 40 bucks ain't that bad. You can barely go to McDonald's. You know, it's like 30 bucks now to, to get dinner, which, which is true, but... I, I don't know. It still felt very half-assed, a little disingenuous. But what the hell do I know? There were like half a million people. Anytime the uh, stream would cut on my TV, I'd pull it up on my phone. And on the phone, they show a, a, a count of how many people are watching. And uh, towards the end, I mean, it was like 492,000 or something. I mean, just, just insane the amount of business KISS does. But they are more than just a band. KISS is a corporation after all. All right, though, I got to run. My fiance is waiting to pull the trigger on my love gun, so I got to go. But thanks so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe if you want to see more, and I will see you next time.